So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Shakobi Wilson. I'm an assistant professor of the Maryland Institute for Applied Environmental Health. Uh, today we have one of our um, special special lectures that we're doing this semester. Uh, I teach Maya 330, which is the undergraduate environmental justice course. Uh, but this semester we'll have a few special lectures, uh, guest uh, speakers, and um, and and we really wanted to shine light on environmental justice issues in a larger way, particularly because of what's going on in Flint. And today we have uh, Bernice Miller Travis, who is uh, a friend, colleague, mentor. She is an icon in the environmental justice movement. I'm gonna give you a little bit of background on her uh, through this introduction. Uh, Bernice Miller Travis is the principal of an environmental consulting group called Miller Travis Associates and a senior associate with Skio Solutions. Uh, she targets her efforts to working with communities that have undergone economic disinvestment, environmental degradation, to facilitate and implement community revitalization and sustainable redevelopment initiatives and projects. She's also a member of the National Environmental Justice Advisory Council, um, which I'm also a member of too, so it's great to be able to work with one of my uh, role models, uh, on Jack. Um, she she co-chaired Jack's work group on school air toxics monitoring. She also serves as vice chair of the Maryland State Commission on Environmental Justice and Sustainable Communities, where she leads an effort to encourage state and local governments uh, to consider the environmental and public health dimensions of local land use and zoning decisions. She also currently serves on the board of directors of the Healthy Schools Network, the North Carolina Association of Black Lawyers, uh, Land Loss Prevention Project, and Imani Energy. For the class, bio, this is important. She is the co-founder and a member of the board of We Act for Environmental Justice, formerly known as West Harlem Environmental Action. A tw um, 28 year old, how old is it now? 29 year old, award winning community based environmental justice advocacy organization in New York City. She's uh, trained as an urban planner and graduated from Columbia University in the city of New York. In 1987 class, she served as a research assistant to the United Church of Christ Commission for Racial Justice and they helped to write and publish their landmark report entitled Toxic Waste and, uh, Toxic Waste and Race in the U.S. Okay. Um, she's a recipient of the American Public Health Association um, section on the environment, Don Lou Smith Environmental Justice Award in 2009. I just want to say that uh, Bernice, as I said before, is an icon uh, of the EJ movement. She's been a, a leader for, what, 35 years in the movement? Um, she is on the Mount Rushmore when it comes to environmental justice, okay? So um, she's done a lot of great work in communities across the country, uh, starting in New York. And it, it's been, you know, without her, we may not have made as much progress as we've made um, on environmental justice. The institutionalization of environmental justice at the federal level, uh, and just making sure that community voices are being heard when it comes to these issues. So, without further ado, um, let's give a round of applause for our guest speaker, Ms. Bernice Miller. -Kyle. Somebody calls you an icon, that means you're old, right? You get the icon status, you're old. Um, and uh, I'll say this: I'm not as I'm older than I look. How about that? Um, a lot older than I look, so they tell me. Um, so where to start? First, good afternoon. Um, it's wonderful to see all of your faces. So, Sokobi, what degrees are they pursuing? These are uh, many students here, undergraduate students, but you also have uh, master's students, I think, and PhD students here. Okay, so I want to say to all of you, um, welcome. I'm so glad to see your faces. It took me a really long time to figure out where I, I had a vision of what, I, what it is I wanted to do, and the vision that I had for myself is not what I wound up doing. So if you had asked me when I was in college what I would be doing, the word environment would never have tumbled out of my mouth. Um, and even public health would not have tumbled out of my mouth. What I thought I was going to do was be a civil rights lawyer because that is what I had always wanted to do. That is what all my academic pursuits were geared towards. Um, working on issues of racial injustice and racial inequality was the, the piece of work that I had carved out for myself. And I stumbled across this work um, in the, the field of, of environment and public health and racial discrimination and how they all came together. So I want to tell you that story because I think it's inspiring. I hope you think it's inspiring. but. 
what I mean by it's inspiring is that I hope my journey and sharing that with you will give you a sense of how you can find a place that you need to be in this work, right? And how you can find what it is that really matters to you to drive you to do what you wind up doing professionally and that you can get paid to do something that you love. I'm here to tell you, you can get paid. And as an environmentalist, um, I've done a lot of things. Most of the stuff that Sokovi mentioned in my bio are things that I do on a volunteer capacity, right? And I've got way too much stuff going on that I volunteer to do. But I get paid really well to do the stuff that I do, right? So I used to direct the Environmental Justice Initiative at the Natural Resources Defense Council. Um, I did that for six years. I was a program officer at the Ford Foundation and developed their first ever environmental justice grant making portfolio. Um, I've worked in a lot of different really interesting places, but a lot of people think when you do good work um, and when you do social justice work that it's basically like being a volunteer. It doesn't have to be, right? You can, and you can figure out a way to marry um, what it is that you do professionally with what it is that you volunteer your time to. And so that, that's sort of how I've made it work for me, is I serve on the boards of a lot of organizations that work on the issues that I care passionately about and I work on, and I get paid to work on. And why is that important? Because y'all have a lot of debt. I didn't, I, so what I'm about to tell you is going to make you all crazy. When I graduated from college, I owed exactly $4,300. Um, in student debt. And you could not tell me that that was not equivalent to $430,000 in debt. Because when I was raised, no do debt, right? Debt is evil, right? And so my dad was really, 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 um, uh, really ingrained in me that whatever you do, you do it with a sense of long time gratification. So you go to Columbia um, and you have an academic scholarship, so you don't eat. You know, so you weigh only 110 pounds. Trust and believe, I haven't seen 110 pounds in 30 years. But it's because I only ate once a day when I was in college. And that was okay when I was in college. It's not okay now, but it was okay then. But what my father instilled in me is that you make sacrifices for the greater good, right? The thing that you are going towards. And a lot of my colleagues, people who didn't, who didn't go to Barnett and Columbia, would say, we don't know why you're struggling like you're struggling, Bernice. Why don't you go to City College? Right? And it'll, it'll be free. And I was like, yes, but it won't be a Columbia degree, right? It won't be a University of Maryland degree. And there is something to be said for the institution that you go to and what you do with what you get from that institution. And so I'm sharing this with you because one day, um, I was very politically active on campus as an undergrad, probably way too politically active. And um, I uh, went to a lecture of this guy, um, Reverend Dr. Benjamin Chavis, and he was a civil rights leader. He worked for the United Church of Christ Commission for Racial Justice. He was the deputy executive director, but Ben had been a political prisoner in the 1970s and actually was in prison by the state of North Carolina, falsely in prison for a number of years. Now, here's an interesting little tidbit. While Ben was in prison, somehow he managed to get a Masters of Divinity and get accepted to a doctorate program at Union Theological. And when he finally was exonerated and released from pris prison, he came to New York to get his PhD in divinity at Union Theological Seminary. And Union Theological Seminary is directly across the street from the college that I went to, Barnett College. I mean, literally, on the other side of the street. And so uh, a co classmate of mine who had by then graduated and um, was uh, uh, studying at UNC Chapel Hill, she mentioned to me that Ben Chavis had moved to New York. And I said, no, that's not possible. Because we were all very active in the, um, the campaign to free Ben Chavis and, and the Wilmington 10 out of prison. And, um, and I said, nah, that's not possible. If Ben was here, you know, I'd know. And she says, I'm telling you, the man moved to New York and he's going to Union Theological Seminary. And I'm like, Union is across the street. I can see it from where I'm standing. And she says, I'm telling you, the man is over there in school somewhere, right? And I was like, okay, Kim. So every day, I would go out walking from my apartment to campus, which was about four blocks away, and I'd be scouring the streets looking for Ben Chavis. And sure enough, one day, I ran into him on the very street that I lived on. We lived on the same street, a block apart. And I was like, I can't believe it. It was 17 degrees outside. And we stood on the corner, both of us with no hats on, and talked for an hour about what was going on on campus, how I didn't think um, students at the time were politically active enough or paying attention to the things that were going on around them. And we struck up a friendship and we stayed in, in communication. And after, um, after I graduated, I would call him at least every quarter to say, you know, you need to hire me. 
because I'm the greatest thing since sliced bread. So here's one lesson, right? You know that you're really good, right? You know that you're really talented. Never, ever, ever sell yourself short, right? So if you meet people, if you, you go to lectures, you go to various programs, you see folks, they're doing stuff that you want to do, build a relationship with those folks and stay in touch with them. Now, you might not want to be a, a pain in the ass about it, as I was, but I'm just saying, you really have to sell yourself and advocate for what it is that you want to do. And so I kept calling Ben, and I said, you really need to hire me. You really need to hire me. And one day, after three years of constantly um, calling him, he said, well, we're getting ready to do this research project. I don't know if you would be interested, but why don't you come in and meet our research director, Charles Lee, and see if you two hit it off. And if you guys like each other, maybe you work on this project. And so the project was called the Special Project on Toxic Injustice. I had no idea what toxic and injustice had to do with each other. Um, I didn't know at all what they were talking about. I had no frame of reference about what they were talking about. I thought I knew practically everything there was to know about racial injustice, but I had never heard about it in the context of environment or exposure to toxic substances. So I go in and I meet with Charles Lee, and Charles and I hit it off immediately, and he hires me as his research assistant. And um, Sokobi mentioned, Dr. Wilson mentioned this report. I'm going to pass it around and share it with you, but um, this is what you call uh, in, in my life um, being spoken to directly by God. Um, and you may not have exactly that experience, but I had this experience where everything that I had thought I was supposed to do with my life, everything that I had planned to do with my life, every political science course I had taken, everything I had done as an undergrad to prepare myself to go to law school was exploded after I had an opportunity to work on this report. And I realized that um, you know, if you're lucky enough in the course of your life, in the course of your work, you will find that thing that speaks to your passion, but also speaks to your training, right? And gives you the space to do the work that you want to do. For me, it was working at the United Church of Christ Commission for Racial Justice because I recognized that there was a whole area of civil rights advocacy that hardly anybody spoke to, including most of the mainline civil rights organizations. You hardly ever heard anybody talk about the confluence of this set of issues, which was that people of color and poor people and tribal communities across the United States were finding themselves the unwitting host of hazardous waste incinerators, hazardous waste landfills, um, chemical manufacturing facilities, storage facilities, transportation corridors, all kinds of things were happening to communities of color and low income and poor communities and tribal communities that communities had no control over. But those things, those circumstances were happening in a way that was fundamentally undermining people's quality of life. And not just in an aesthetic sense, but literally killing people. And so we went to do this project. And so what, what was the hypothesis of this research project? Three things. We wanted to look at the location of hazardous waste sites in the United States. So this research was conducted between 1985 and 1987. And so we used the list that the Environmental Protection Agency developed and still um, develops and controls today called a National Priorities List. And the National Priorities List is a list that the Environmental Protection Agency keeps of the known most hazardous sites in the United States. Sites that are so hazardous that they pose imminent threat to human health and the environment. And they keep a list of those sites, and they score which sites, they do a hazardous ranking system score, and they decide which sites pose imminent threat. And then they marshal the resources to send contractors out to clean up and remediate those sites. So we took EPA's national priorities list. We wanted to know the residential zip code in which those sites were located. And then we wanted to know what was the racial composition of the residential zip codes in which those sites were located. And what we found was that race proved to be the most statistically significant indicator and in where those sites were located. We looked at dozens and dozens and dozens of other variables. Level of educational attainment, land value, home value, home ownership, um, just on and on and on and on. We looked at all kinds of social variables, race among them. And race proved to be the most statistically significant indicator in where those sites were located. This was not mind-blowing. Um, in fact, 
I remember um, having a conversation with my grandmother at the time when I was doing this research because I was so excited. I was so excited by what I was finding. And I shared it with my grandmother who was a nurse. And my grandmother said, so how much money did y'all spend on this report? And I said, I don't know, Grandma. I think about $150,000. And she said, I am so glad I am not a member of the United Church of Christ. So we, 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 we all grew up Catholic. And my grandmother was still a practicing Catholic. And she said, because I would be some kind of mad if you all had spent $150,000 of the money that I helped to give the church to document a phenomenon that every black person in America knows to be true. Right? And I'm like, really? And she's like, yeah, really. And I'm like, but here's the thing. We know it anecdotally. We don't know it empirically. Right? We know it in our souls because we know the landfill is down the street. We know the junkyard is near where we live. We know the incinerator is near where we live. We know the bus barn is near where we live. We know it. And it's true. Almost every community of color in the United States can give you some, some example of that. But there was nothing to document this reality. And so this report was the first report to document that reality. And, in, and when we published the report in April of 1987, how many of y'all were born in 1987? Dang on. Okay. It was a great day. Trust and believe. It was a great day. Um, when, we, when we released the report, uh, we had a press conference at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C., and I remember Ben Chavis, who by then was the executive director of the Commission for Racial Justice. Ben said, what we have documented is what we refer to as environmental racism. And that was the first time I had ever heard the term environmental racism was in that press conference when we released this report. And so that set the press all agog. Well, what does that mean, right? And he said, well, it means that people of color are being targeted to be the unwitting host of facilities, of processes, of the storage of hazardous waste, such that it undermines the quality of their life in a fundamental way. From then until now, a tremendous amount of research has been done to document this phenomenon. A lot of it has been done by Dr. Wilson himself. So if you're interested in this subject, and I imagine if you're taking his course, you are interested in this subject, you should know that while I may have been doing this for a really long time, Dr. Wilson is one of the people who are continuing to document this phenomenon across the United States. And we are really blessed to have him here in Maryland. So y'all know he came from the University of South Carolina to be here. He had, did his PhD work at the University of Michigan and also work at the University of North Carolina. But to have him here in Maryland is to really elevate this conversation in Maryland to a level that it hasn't been before, to document what is going on in communities here in Maryland. Because this stuff is so easy to not see, right? It's underground. It's in the water. It's in the air. It's not like there's a big billboard with flashing signs that tell you, stop here, people are being harmed by environmental substances. It's oftentimes really hard to see, like the circumstances in Flint, right? The, and in the case of Flint, one of the good things is that the water didn't look right. Now, if the substances, the toxic substances that are in their drinking water, if those substances were clear and invisible, we might not be having this conversation about the impact of the quality of the drinking water in Flint because you can't see it. And that's so much the problem with so many of these communities that are facing environmental threats. They're not readily apparent. So if it's a leaking underground storage tank that's leaking toxic substances underground into groundwater sources, that's really hard to find. If it's uh, an, an amazing amount of air pollution. Most ambient sources of air pollution are invisible to the human eye. It's really hard to see. And we have this phenomenon in practice in our country when, where poor communities and distressed communities say they're having a problem. Those problems get discounted, get dismissed. Those communities get discounted and dismissed. And so you need to mount an enormous amount of energy and mobilization and organizing and persistence to get people to interface with decision makers so that they recognize and understand and respond to the crises that are happening in communities across the United States. So I can tell you now, by the time we finish having this conversation, 
this is not going to be a cheery conversation. You're not going to come out of today's lecture and say, oh wow, I feel, you might feel empowered, but you're not going to be happy. Because there's so many flints around the United States. So let's look at the state of Michigan. In the state of Michigan, there are 13 cities today that have higher levels of lead in their drinking water than does Flint, Michigan. 13 cities in the state of Michigan, right? In the District of Columbia, otherwise known as the nation's capital, we had a lead problem in our drinking water supply 10 years ago. Same exact circumstance that's happening in Flint happened in DC. And people had to mobilize, people had to really go to the mat with the Washington um, Sanitation and Suburban Water Commission to get them to pay attention to this issue. And from that day until this, that was 2005, when they found the, lead, the elevated lead levels in DC's drinking water, my husband and I have not drunk water out of our tap from 2005 until now and never intend to do so again. Because you do not know. Once you have had a problem like that, I think, at least we think, for our own, our own health and well-being, it's really, really difficult to trust the Washington Suburban Sanitation Commission again that they have completely eliminated this problem. So we, as middle class folks, can afford to buy drinking water. And we do, all the time. And we buy distilled water, which I would recommend if you're going to buy water, buy distilled water. Because distilled water actually pulls out all of the impurities and the heavy metals in the water. Um, um, other drinking water sources don't necessarily do that. We can do that. We can afford to do that. We don't have any kids. Um, nobody lives in our house but the two of us. We can buy drinking water from now until the end of time. Everybody can't do that, and everybody shouldn't have to do that, right? You should be able to trust that when you turn on your tap in a modern, industrialized nation, that the water that comes out of that tap is safe, is not going to cause you adverse health impacts, and is safe to consume. At a fundamental level, we should all be able to have that trust. Now, I'm from New York originally. We have the best drinking water in the United States of America. <laughs> You turn on the tap, and out comes pure gold. It's cold, it tastes good, it has flavor even. I don't mean like Kool-Aid flavor, but it's good water. And everybody everywhere will tell you that New York City has some of the best drinking water in the United States of America. And why is that? Because the organization I used to work for, the Natural Resources Defense Council, has thrown down with every jurisdiction, every city, every municipality, every village, legally, within a 250 mile radius of New York City around the source water for New York City. And they focus, there's one person who used to be my supervisor, Eric Goldstein, a brilliant environmental attorney. Eric does one thing every day, fight to protect the source of the drinking water that flows to New York City. That's all Eric works on, that's it. Before that, he worked on getting lead out of gasoline. So he's done a couple of significant things in his life, right? But it requires that kind of vigilance. And whenever Eric sees, or other colleagues who are working with Eric, they see that somebody is trying to build a new development within that 250 mile radius, they go to war in the courts. And they make sure that there are stringent guidelines in place about how that development happens how they eliminate wastewater, how they treat wastewater, and how they make sure that they protect the quality of the drinking water that flows into New York City's reservoirs and then into households in New York City. Obviously, nobody is doing that in Flint, Michigan. And there are political reasons why that's not happening in Flint, Michigan. Now, there's all kinds of communities in, in Michigan, right? There are affluent communities in Michigan, there are tribal communities in Michigan, there are urban communities in Michigan, there are immigrant communities in Michigan, there are all kinds of communities in Michigan. One of the troubling phenomena right now is how come most of the jurisdictions that are overwhelmingly populated by people of color are, are now uh, being led by emergency managers as opposed to locally elected mayors and city councils. Those emergency managers have stripped the power of elective government from those municipalities, and they now are making the decisions about purchasing 
about law enforcement, about everything that comes in, in, into the flow of life for a local, a local community. Those decisions are no longer being made in these municipalities by those locally elected officials, but instead by emergency managers that were appointed by the governor. The city of Detroit, um, most folks uh, have watched the city of Detroit go through bankruptcy and have an emergency manager put in place. The District of Columbia had an emergency manager during the Clinton administration because it was thought by Congress that D.C. couldn't manage its own finances, so they put in place an emergency manager. But there are other cities in, in Michigan that are also struggling, right? Michigan as a state is really having a hard time, and why is that? Because the foundation of their economic system, which is auto manufacturing, and all of the industries that service the auto manufacturing sector, they are going belly up, and, and steel, steel milling. Those two sectors, have been hurt and devastated by the outflow of jobs to other countries where they pay people less than the labor, organized labor uh, workforce in the state of Michigan. So Saginaw, Michigan, Flint, Michigan, Detroit, Michigan, you can name city after city after city that used to be thriving economically that are struggling now because the auto industry has gone down on its heels. And if your whole economy is based on one economic sector, when that sector goes belly up or changes dramatically, it affects you. So the point here is this. It's not just cities where black people live in Michigan that are suffering economically. But how come those are the only cities that have emergency managers put in place in, instead of their local government? So when you hear this conversation about the role of the governor, and the governor, um, I, I just have to say, I, I've, I've had some apoplectic moments about the governor of Michigan. One of which was to see him be interviewed on this program that I watch every morning on MSNBC called Morning Joe. There was an uh, uh, editorial in the New York Times, which is my hometown newspaper that I read every day. Before I start my day, I read the New York Times. And I also read the Washington Post. But I especially read the New York Times. It may not be all the news that's fit to print, but it's the news that I want to read. So that's the newspaper that I read. There was an editorial in the New York Times about four weeks ago. Is Flint, the title of the editorial was, Is Flint an Example of Environmental Racism? I thought I was going to lose my mind. Environmental racism in one sentence in the New York Times. It just doesn't happen that often. It doesn't happen at all. In fact, it was the first time in known memory that I've ever seen that happen. So there's an article in the editorial of the New York Times, right? One of the most powerful editorial pages in the United States. And they ask the question, is the water crisis in Flint an example of environmental racism? And so later that very day, uh, Joe, uh, former Congressman Joe Scarborough and Mika Brzezinski are going to interview um, Governor Schneider. And they ask him, I mean, they're asking him questions straight out of the New York Times editorial. And they ask him the question, so is this an example of environmental racism? And first he stumbled around, and then he said, absolutely not. Look at all the great things we're doing in Detroit. And I'm like, Detroit? Really? Detroit? Where there's so many environmental racism issues and environmental justice issues happening in Detroit, you need a freaking encyclopedia. You need a scorecard. I pick a neighborhood, any neighborhood. Water quality, the Marathon Refinery, steel mills, where you're putting the, the effluent that's coming out of the few um, car manufacturing plants that are still, still operating. The expansion of the bridge between Can Windsor, Canada, and Detroit. Pick an issue, any issue. Detroit, really? You want to lift up Detroit as the place that y'all are doing great things at? It was clear he didn't know what the hell to say. But it was also clear that he was lying. Now you know, you know when you do it, you know when somebody else does it. When you're talking to somebody and you ask them a direct question and they get to, you know, coming up with all these wild stuff, you know they're lying. And he was lying on national television. But what he did that really made me crazy was he said, well, I'm going to take responsibility because I'm the governor. But really, this ain't my fault. You know whose fault it is? It's some poor stupid person. And he said some poor stupid person who works at the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality who signed off that this water was, was good. And I'm like, no, he did not. Just throw some poor civil servant who works for Michigan DEQ under the bus and said it was some poor engineer at the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality's fault. No, he did not just do that. And then, unfortunately, about 30 minutes later, 
a very good colleague of mine and, and Dr. Wilson's, Mustafa Ali, who is the chief environmental justice staff person at the United States Environmental Protection Agency, he called me about something completely unrelated. And poor Mustafa, because for an hour, I absolutely went crazy on him on the telephone. What the hell is EPA doing, right? Yes, the EPA office in Chicago that's responsible for EPA Region 5, in which Michigan is a part, what are y'all doing? What is the leader of EPA Region 5 doing in Michigan? What are they doing? Because you got to tell me somebody in the office of water at EPA is taking water samples, right? Why do I know they're doing that? Because it's a requirement of both the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act. When you switch the source of drinking water for any population, you have got to monitor the quality of that water on regular intervals and report what those intervals are and measure them against the quality of the water before you change the water to the quality of the water after you change the water source. That's a requirement in federal law, both the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act. And I said, so somebody at EPA must be doing that, right? So y'all didn't just find out that the water in, lead, in, in Flint was tainted with lead. Somebody has known that for quite some time. What are y'all doing? And poor Mustafa, right? He's like, Bernice, I'm going to find out. I said, you better find out quick, because in a minute, NRDC is going to be suing you. Trust and believe. I know. And sure enough, that, that is what's happened. But the point is that it shouldn't take this level of national attention to focus on something so fundamental and so foundational as making sure that people have safe drinking water in the United States of America. So you know, we have an agency in the United States government, it's part of the State Department, it's called USAID. How many of you have heard of USAID? So USAID is the entity that funds most international development work that the United States government funds around the world. And one of the biggest things that we spend money on in other parts of the world is water filtration systems, right? We build safe and clean drinking water systems for people around the world. And why do we do that? Because it's the most fundamental element of human life. You need two things to live. Really only two things. You need clean water and you need clean air. You don't actually need food as much as you need clean water. You can actually survive for a really long time just drinking water. But you got to have water. And if the water that you drink is contaminated, that is going to affect you in a million different ways. But if it's contaminated with heavy metals, as lead is, and the thing that's so devastating about what's going on in Flint is that we know of two substances in the environment that have irreversible health impacts. One is asbestos, and the other is lead. Now, you will learn from Dr. Wilson as this course goes on, you're learning already, we have a really serious problem in our country. Oh, here's, I meant to pass this out. Here's toxic waste and race. That's the actual report. Um, another law that we have in the US that is not being very well enforced is called the Toxic Substances Control Act, TOSCA, which was originally passed in 1976 by Congress. And TOSCA is supposed to, um, is supposed to protect uh, the population of the United States from undue exposure to toxic substances. So chemicals, chemicals in the air, chemicals in the water, chemicals in the food supply, chemicals that are used um, industrially, chemicals that are used commercially. So right now there are 70,000 chemical substances that are in commercial use in the United States of America. Let's take a guess. How many of those 70,000 chemicals does EPA know what harm those chemicals will cause to the human population. Is it 10%? How many people say 10%? 20%? 40%? 20% here? 40% there? 50%? 50%? 60%? 75%? 75%? How many people think EPA has clear scientific knowledge of the vast majority of chemicals that are in commercial use in the United States right now. One, two, okay. So, let me break it to you. EPA knows about the, the chemical constituents of 300 
of the 70,000 chemicals that are in commercial use in the United States right now. 300. And that's what the Toxic Substances Control Act was supposed to give the Environmental Protection Agency the power to regulate and understand before they would allow those chemicals to go into commercial use. So for example, how many of you either in doing yard work or in seeing your parents do yard work or somebody do yard work have seen people use Roundup? Roundup is a highly, highly, highly toxic substance that in other countries, in Europe, the chemical constituents of Roundup have been banned from commercial use. So like I said, Y'all might not love this conversation, but you're going to be informed by this conversation, but you're not going to be happy when I get finished sharing this information with you. And this is just a small slice of what's going on in our country right now. Right? So why, why does the EPA have so little information about chemicals that it, it allows to be in commercial use in the United States? Because the manufacturer of those chemicals use all their influence to prohibit EPA from getting more information. So what they say is, if we share that information with EPA, that's proprietary information. And proprietary information means you, are, you then get to open our books and see how we make the stuff. And if you see how we make the stuff, then we no longer have a product that we can sell because only we know how to make it. Now everybody knows how to make it. So we can't let you, EPA, know what's in the chemicals that we're using. Did you know that your government is prohibited from knowing what's actually in the chemicals that you use? Kind of scary, right? So right now there's an effort in Congress to strengthen the Toxic Substances Control Act for the first time since the act was originally passed by Congress in 1976. It's been taking a really long time. One of the leading members of Congress, um, one of the leading environmental voices in Congress, um, the late Senator Frank Lautenberg from New Jersey. Senator Lautenberg died from cancer. He fought cancer three times, came back, and then died while he's going through this process to lead the, the, the reauthorization and expansion of the Toxic Substances Control Act. This morning, yesterday, in the Washington Post, there's an article that says Monsanto, formerly known as Monsanto, one of the biggest chemical manufacturers in the United States, is working with the majority party, this is going to get a little partisan, otherwise known as Republicans, on the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee to have a paragraph in the new Toxic Substances Control Act that will exonerate Monsanto from any legal liability associated with any substance that it makes. Now trust and believe, just keep watching this page, that if that, if it's a very big if, whether a revised Toxic Substances Control Act is actually going to be passed by this Congress. But if it does get passed by this Congress, that paragraph protecting Monsanto from liability is going to be in that bill. And it's not only going to be Monsanto that's going to have carve-outs in that bill. And that's how our legislative process works, right? So there, the environmentalists and communities and the public health field is on one side. We, we have a lot of voices. We have a lot of passion, we have a lot of science. But then there's industry on the other side. They got a lot of science that they pay for and manufacture. They have a lot of power because they have a lot of money and they usually win in the legislative process. So in case you're wondering what these battles are that you read about, about environmental legislation, that's what the battle is about. The folks that want to protect human health and the environment and the folks that want to protect their proprietary right to continue to manufacture substances that harm human health and the environment because they make money from it. Roundup is a big seller. Have you ever gone into Home Depot or Walmart or any other store, garden supply store, and you look at the section where the insecticides are? The section where the insecticides are is rows and rows and rows of substances. The section where the natural organic products are is usually some little section that you gotta find with a map in a store, right? Because the chemical manufacturers have a lot of power and a lot of influence. And that power and that influence affects the quality of your life every day and it affects the quality of lives of folks who don't have that power and authority. And so what, what we try to do in the environmental justice space is to equalize that balance. 
is to make sure that people have science and data, and that science and data is publicly accessible, that you don't have to have a PhD to be able to understand this is not safe, right? And that's going to be part of your job. If you, can, if you decide that the public health arena and the environmental space is where you want to work, you get to make a choice. Where do I want to be in this conversation? Do I want to help to give people information that arms them and protects them? Or do I want to work in the space that continues to manufacture or at least help products get manufactured that make money for somebody but may not be the safest? So we have known for a really long time, since the 1970s, that lead is a neurotoxin. And what does that mean? It means that lead affects the central nervous system. If you ingest lead, if you're exposed to lead, it affects the central nervous system, right? So you lose the ability to have impulse control. You lose the ability to have violence control. You lose the ability to have cognitive control so that you can grow and learn and master complex information. So what happens to somebody who's exposed to lead? you begin to have developmental and intellectual difficulty. If you're a child in the developmental stages, particularly a fetus in development, so pregnant women and or children under six years of age are the most vulnerable to exposure to lead, right? So let's just sort of think about stuff that's, that's happened in our consciousness r recently. So one of the things we know about, um, about the murder of Freddie Gray in Baltimore is that Freddie Gray was lead poisoned as a child, right? And if you remember, not that I think that this is a really good example of this, but if you remember, one of the things that the, the Baltimore Police Department said is that they saw Freddie Gray, they encountered him on the street, he looked at them, they looked at him, and then he ran, right? Now, the average black person when encountering the police, is not necessarily going to step to the police and say, let me have a conversation with you, just based on our own experience with, with municipal police departments. But maybe, maybe in Freddie Gray's case, he had already lost impulse control as a child, right? Because he was lead poisoned as a child. And how do we know that? Because the, New York, the Washington Post did an extraordinary examination of Freddie Gray's life, an extraordinary article that I highly recommend to you. And they talked about what had happened to him over the course of his life. And when he was eight years old, he and his twin sister were, um, were um, diagnosed as being lead poisoned. And his mother had a lawyer who got a settlement from the landlord in the apartment that they lived in um, for allowing them to live in, in a lead contaminated residence, which is against the law in Baltimore City and in most places in the United States. So they get a small settlement, but it can't do anything to restore his cognitive abilities or his developmental abilities. One of the things we know about lead is that if you have been exposed to lead as a child, they can tell you over the course of your lifetime how much less you will make in income because you have been exposed to lead. They can indicate to you the likelihood that you will not graduate from high school, you will not graduate from college, and you certainly won't go on to higher academic pursuits. They can tell you that there is a likelihood that you will encounter and interact with the criminal justice system. Lead is a bad, bad, bad thing. And the worst thing about lead exposure is that it can never be undone. It cannot be undone. You can't go and have it remediated. You can't have a blood transfusion and have all your blood taken out and blood put back in. And that, that is a, a, a medical process called plasmapheresis. You can do that. You can do that, but you can't get the lead out of your system. You can't get it out of your brain. You can't get it out of your, your matter. Once you have been exposed to lead, it will impact you for the rest of your life. The rest of your life. And that's why the situation in Flint is so, so horrific. And that people knew about it and allowed it to happen. And that until folks rose up in Flint, Michigan, and other people began to pay attention, mostly the credit goes to one journalist, right? 
Does anybody know who that one journalist is? I'll give you a hint. MSNBC, Rachel Maddow. Rachel Maddow has been reporting this story for years. First about the emergency manager situation, and then about the decisions that these emergency managers were making on behalf of local governments in Michigan. And then we have this wonderful engineering professor at, um, at Virginia Tech, and this great pediatrician in, um, in Flint, who was noticing how many babies were now showing up with um, elevated blood lead levels. And they had to fight like hell. They had to fight like hell to be able to get that story out. So the really sad, the saddest thing about all of this is that Flint, Michigan is not the worst example of environmental injustice in the United States. It's not even close. It's bad, but it's not even close to some of the other communities across the U.S. that are fighting a variety of environmental assaults. Baltimore City is going through some pretty rough stuff. They've had a lead belt and a lead problem in Baltimore City since the 80s. And people want to study it and study it and study it, but the real estate industry wants to fight perpetually in litigation in the courts with Baltimore City about whether or not they should go forward and implement a ban on housing that has lead present in, present in it. They should be remediating that so that people can be safe. But instead of that happening for the last 25 years, the real estate industry of Baltimore City has been fighting in the courts, both uh, at the state level and at the local level, to keep landlords from having to remediate unsafe housing. Who does that in a, in a developed country? Who does that? But, so now we have banned lead from many substances. You can't put lead in paint anymore. Does anybody know why they used to put lead in paint? Because it didn't ship. And it lasted a really, really, really long time. That's why they used to always paint bridges with lead, lead, lead coated paint. So you can't put lead in paint anymore. That's how it got on the walls and in houses and in old structures. You can't put lead in gasoline anymore because it was combusting and becoming part of the air that everybody breathed. You can't put lead batteries and, and products made with lead in the soil anymore. That's where so many Superfund sites came from. So you can't do all of these things around lead because we now know that lead is a neurotoxin. But so what do we do with those lead substances? Have we stopped manufacturing them in the United States? No. We've just stopped selling them in the American market. In Mexico, American-based companies are still selling paint that has lead in it, are still selling products that has lead in it. In Mexico, in the Caribbean, across Latin America, in Africa. So if you know it's a neurotoxin and it harms human health and the environment in the United States, why would you continue to manufacture it and sell it to people in other countries? Why would you do that? Because you want to make money not because you care about the environment or human health. So when you hear people having these conversations in the public space, know that at the foundation of it, this is what the debate is really about. It's not about whether somebody's hair is their hair or not. It's not about whether somebody is a, is a bore, and by a bore I mean not necessarily boring, but um, having no class, a bore, right? It's not about whether um, somebody likes immigrants or doesn't like immigrants, right? It's not really about that. It's about whether or not people will have the right to elect representatives who represent their interests in a political system versus the power of corporate money. That's Vernice's opinion, right? But my opinion has been borne out time and time and time again in the work that I do to advance environmental legislation at the federal level. So I work on this all the time in my spare time. I work on getting environmental legislation passed. It's been really hard in this Congress, really hard. We've gotten a lot done, but we could have done a lot more if we hadn't had so much pushback on the other side. And that pushback is largely fueled by resources from these companies that want carve-outs in the legislation. And when they can't get actual carve-outs like Monsanto is trying to do in the Toxic Substances Control Act, then they just want the legislation to not go forward. 
So we've spent the last eight years, those of us in the environmental community, beating back riders to other pieces of legislation that have nothing to do with environmental issues, but they tack on a rider that says, and oh, by the way, we don't want EPA to be, in, be able to enforce the waters of the United States rule. And oh, by the way, we don't want EPA to have the staff to declare coal ash as a hazardous substance. It could be on a defense appropriations bill. It could be on the HUD housing and urban development appropriations bill. Nothing to do with the environment. That's what we've spent the last eight years doing. So if this is work that you want to do, you can see I get kind of fired up about it. I love what I do. I love what I do. I get up every day, every day, ready to go and fight. I know he does because he's always sending me freaking text messages. Bernice, have you done that? Bernice, have you done this? Bernice, have you called that person, right? And that's the stuff we do in our spare time. Because we know that communities deserve the right to be safe in their homes, that they deserve the right to be able to turn on the faucet and know that the water that they drink and that they feed their families is safe, that the air that they breathe is not poisoning them or causing their children and their loved ones to develop asthma and respiratory diseases, that the, the playgrounds where their kids play, that the soil is safe, that the food that they eat is not tainted with chemicals and pesticides that it's been grown with. We believe that people in this country, and in every country, but especially in this country, have that right. And so we spend our time every day trying to figure out what's the best path to get strong environmental legislation passed. What's the best path to make sure that public health provisions are fully enforced? What's the best path to make sure that people have information so that they can make informed decisions about their consumer choices? That's what we do every day. And most of us who do it, we love it. There are just not enough hours in the day to do the things that we need to do. But so, this might be a dire conversation, but I trust you, I, I say to you, you will never be bored. You will always be proud of the work that you get to do. You will know that you are working to make society better. You can work it here in the United States, you can work it around the world. When I worked at the Ford Foundation, I didn't just work on environmental issues in the United States, I worked on environmental justice issues globally. So I worked on issues in Nepal, I worked on issues in, in India, I worked on issues in South Africa, I worked on issues in Brazil, in addition to working and supporting work in the United States. This is a global conversation about environmental justice, there are climate dimensions to the conversation, there are public health dimensions to the conversation, there are agricultural dimensions, there are science dimensions, there are land use and planning issues. I'm an urban planner. There's every way that you can imagine to work on these issues, there's a space for you in this conversation. And I just wish I had had the common sense that you all have to know that this is what I wanted to do when I was an undergrad. I, I graduated from school with a political science degree. I thought I was work, going to work on civil rights policy, and then I wound up at the United Church of Christ. And my, the course of my life changed. And then I went back to graduate school 10 years after I got out of college to get an urban planning degree, because I said, if people can't control decisions around land use and zoning, they have no control over their lives. And so that's where I decided to put you know, my stick in the ground. But this is really exciting work. It really matters to people. And if you can take what you do and do it in service of a community that otherwise would not get to have their rights respected like the folks in Flint are having a hard time now doing, imagine how you will feel when you can help balance that out and make sure that people are the safest that they can be in their homes and their communities. There's nothing greater than that. Absolutely nothing greater than that. I'll stop there. Thank you so very much. So, uh, class is over at 145, so they're going to be running out of here in okay. the next class. Okay. So, let's take some questions um, from the students. Please. And Bernice covered a lot of stuff that we have covered in class, and you got first hand accounts of you know, the United Church of Christ study. So, what questions do you have? 
Yes. Quick. Tell me your name. Hi, my name is Nikki Waxman. Where are you from? I'm, a, Nikki? I'm from Rockville. Rockville. Um, okay. And I'm a senior government and politics major, and Excellent. I'm really interested in environmental law. Excellent. Um, I have a question about what you said about 13 cities in Michigan having higher lead content than Flint. Mm -hmm. Why is it that Flint is getting so much national attention and not these other cities? I would say because of the professor at uh, Virginia Tech, the engineering professor, and because of the pediatrician um, at the local hospital in Flint, I would say that because they had definitive data and samples that they had taken, that it, it changed the, the trajectory of that conversation. So, you know, the governor and the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality kept saying, the water is safe, the water is safe, the water is safe. But they had this incontrovertible evidence from samples that they had taken that the water is not safe. Um, and um, folks just really rose up to, you know, to really, to, to sort of battle on behalf of their families and their communities. But again, um, that water being so discolored when it comes out of the tap uh, was a real sort of clear bellwether that we have a problem here. Um, I'm not sure why the other city, Saginaw, Michigan is, what's the, is Saginaw the capital of Michigan? Who's the capital of Michigan? This is the capital of Michigan. What is the capital of Michigan? <laughs> he went to the University of Michigan, that's my math. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm whatever sorry, the city is, I, I can't believe I can't remember the capital of Michigan, but anyway, whatever the capital city is, they are one of those cities that has a higher elevated level of, of lead in their drinking water than does Flint. Um, I would say it was, it's really the combination of, of that data and those two really persistent scientists, the pediatrician, you're looking it up? It's, the pedi it's what? Lansing. 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 That's right, Lansing. Lansing is one of those cities that has higher um, levels of lead in their drinking water than does Flint. Um, I would say it's a combination of that hard empirical data. Um, these, you know, they tried to fire that pediatrician um, from her job at the hospital where she works. They tried to discredit her. Um, they personally tried to destroy her, and she just wasn't having it, right? She just wasn't having it. But not everybody has that kind of fortitude. Um, I, I would say it's a combination of hard empirical data and a mobilized um, community that really just fought to know that, and, and when you know, you know, as, as adults, somebody tells you you have a health issue, you know, you, you'll, you'll be challenged by it, but you know, you will marshal whatever resources you need and whatever fortitude to, to do what you need to do. But when your child has been poisoned, and you know that that poisoning is irreversible, that's a whole different sort of trajectory and conversation, right? So I think it's, it's the focus on children's health I mean, again, this was a pediatrician who was seeing all these children come in with elevated blood lead levels. I think those things have focused on it. And I, I just have to give props to Rachel Maddow, who I watch every night. Um, Y'all should be studying probably at 9 o'clock. But if you're not, you know, <laughs> spend some time watching Rachel. She, you know, she has just been killing it on this story, but also on the relationship between governance and policy. Right? So you're a political science and government major, as was I. Um, and that's why I studied policy and governance, because I wanted to be able to affect and understand how public policy is made. And I still do that every day, right? Um, you, you may not see the clear implications of my poli-sci degree, but I'm looking at how policy is made and how you bring the experience of communities to bear within how that policy is developed. And not a lot of people do that, right? It's a very small window of people who really understand the, the development and the intricacies of environmental policy. And I'm one of those people. But I do it on behalf of communities, right? And I, and I have to say that it's the time that I spent working at the Natural Resources Defense Council that made me so good in that arena. So you, you, know, you figure out if this is what you want to do, or you think this is what you want to do, try and, and go and work, even as an intern, at places that do that work in the way that you, you like their approach, right? You like what they do. You like, you want to be in that space. And one of the best ways to get into a nonprofit organization is to work there as an intern. So that people get to know who you are, they see what your skill set is, and the next thing you know, a job opens. It may not be the perfect job that you want, but it's your foot in the door. I, I can't tell you how many people came through NRDC as interns when I worked there who are now program directors at NRDC. Right? They came through the door in the way that they could, and then they stayed, and they developed a career there.